Charles Barkley was one of the greatest players in the history of professional basketball. He was the height of a guard and accordingly nimble with the ball in his hands, but he was also wide and exceptionally powerful, able to fly in transition or explode off the floor right under the basket. Those qualities helped make him the shortest player ever to lead the league in rebounding, his supreme skill alongside prolific, versatile, extremely efficient scoring in his prime. Barkley became an all-star in 1987 and remained one for a decade, earning All-NBA First Team honors five of those years. Soon after his first Olympic gold medal, Barkley won 1993 NBA MVP, beating out some legendary competition. Barkley's individual greatness has been honored with two retired jerseys, plus a spot in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Barkley has every individual achievement, every accolade you could dream of, but despite all that, he's missing the ultimate team accomplishment, an NBA championship. Why, despite his greatness, did his teams never win at all? How exactly did Charles Barkley end up untitled? Barkley entered the NBA on a fortunate note. He was one of several future Hall of Famers taken in the storied 1984 draft. But unlike first pick Hakeem Olajuwon and third pick Michael Jordan, who were grabbed by the sorts of losing teams you typically find among the top selections, Barkley was picked by a contending team. The Philadelphia 76ers didn't lose their way into the fifth pick of the 84 draft. They received it as compensation for a trade with the miserable and foolish Clippers in 1978. The squad Barkley joined was stacked, with a Hall of Fame frontcourt tandem of Julius Irving and Moses Malone, supported by stars like Maurice Cheeks, Andrew Toney, and Bobby Jones. The Sixers were coming off a relatively down year that ended with a playoff upset, but the season prior, they had absolutely incinerated their playoff competition to win the 1983 title. So the reigning SEC Player of the Year found himself among champions. Charles was the rare top five pick who'd get to vie for a championship right from his rookie season. And the kid impressed coach Billy Cunningham enough to earn a starting spot on a team that won 58 games and cruised into the 1985 Eastern Conference Finals. Just one problem, the Celtics. Larry Bird and the defending champs were just as stacked and sprinted to a 3-0 series lead before the Sixers figured out that they should be starting Barkley like they did in the regular season. The rookie rejoined the starting lineup and helped Philly to a Game 4 victory, gobbling up 20 rebounds, but thanks to Bird's last second steal in Game 5, the series and the season slipped away. No one could have known it at the time, but 1985 would be the last and best chance for that version of the Sixers to win another title. They would never get another crack at Bird's Celtics. In 86, the Bucks eliminated Philly from the playoffs when Irving missed a Game 7 buzzer beater. Even if that shot went in, the Sixers surely would have lost to the Celtics again. Malone was out for the whole postseason with an eye injury. And that was the beginning of the end in Philly. Barkley was improving rapidly. He became an all-star for the first time in 87. But the once champion Sixers were crumbling around him. On draft night of 1986, Philadelphia made two dismal trades. Jones retired in 86, Irving in 87, Tony in 88. So, Barkley had chances to win an NBA title immediately upon entering the league, but the Sixers weren't the only powerhouse in the East, and after they fell short, they dissolved. Barkley had become a superstar, a centerpiece, but so had his best classmate, Michael Jordan. And Jordan's team was headed in a different direction. Even as Barkley began to enter the MVP conversation, the stripped-down Sixers had some down years to end the 80s. Charles got his first taste of losing and of missing the playoffs. Barkley's good friend Michael experienced an opposite and more typical trend with the Bulls. Chicago's rise paralleled that of their young star, losing, then playoff success, then contention. The Sixers knew they had to retool fast around the ascending Barkley. Philly accumulated a youngish, rhyming backcourt, a veteran frontcourt, and eventually one of the tallest human beings on the planet. They were back in business. But the Bulls' rebuild had that head start, and in consecutive second-round playoff matchups, MJ's squad kicked the shit out of Barclays. Those Bulls were entering their peak, and after defeating the Sixers in 91, they'd go on to win MJ his first of many championships. Charles, meanwhile, watched his championship aspirations fade. 
In 1991, the Sixers irritated their 28-year-old star by failing to re-sign Rick Mahorn, who had, with Barkley, formed the gritty, grimy, elite rebounding tandem nicknamed Thump and Bump. The 91-92 Sixers further peeved their star with poor play, and he lashed out repeatedly. Those jerseys can't have helped. Barkley couldn't afford to be patient, couldn't waste his prime losing, so he agitated for a trade and got one. And here again was some very good fortune. Barkley nearly went to the middling Lakers in a mid-season deal for their best player, James Worthy. Instead, Charles got dealt at season's end to the Suns, a very good team that gave up relatively little to get him. Probably because Barkley had earned a bit of a reputation for bad-mouthing teammates, fighting, and on one occasion spitting at fans. That is how a superstar in his prime ends up getting traded for Jeff Hornacek. Anyway, Suns owner slash GM Jerry Colangelo deemed Charles worth the trouble and that utter fleecing of the Sixers paid off. Barkley was brilliant enough to win 1993 league MVP over his old 84 classmates, and he had the right people around him. Rookie head coach Paul Westfall led the way, Kevin Johnson and Dan Marley made up a strong backcourt, supplemented by a healthy mix of young talent and veteran presence. Barkley and Tom Chambers restructured their contracts so Phoenix could add bench depth in the form of Danny Ainge. This team was serious. And Phoenix won 62 games, best in the NBA. That's despite Johnson, the star point guard, missing dozens of games because of injuries related to an undiagnosed hernia he reportedly suffered while trying to pick up rookie teammate Oliver Miller. Hernias would plague Johnson the rest of his career, and as far as I can tell, that Oliver Miller story is completely true. In the playoffs, the top-seeded Suns came back from a first-round scare against the underdog Lakers. Miller played a big part in the Game 5 victory. Then they eliminated David Robinson and the Spurs in the next round thanks to Barkley's 28-point, 21-rebound performance in Game 6, which he punctuated with the game-winning shot. Barkley was even more incredible in the Western Conference Finals against the Sonics. He logged 44 points and 24 boards and literally played Seattle star Sean Kemp off the floor in a decisive Game 7 victory. Play Kemp fouls out and Barkley goes to score more. Phoenix earned their first ever trip to the NBA Finals where they would face, oh, come on. Yeah, unfortunately, even if you played out West, you eventually had to get through Jordan to win a ring. So while Charles kept getting dinner with his pal Michael between games, the two resumed war on the court for the third postseason in four years. The war kind of seemed over after the early battles. The Suns had home court advantage, but immediately squandered it in the first two games. Jordan and Scottie Pippen diced up Phoenix's defense with ease. Kevin Johnson was outplayed by Chicago's BJ Armstrong to the point that Barkley admonished Phoenix fans for booing his point guard. Game two was pretty close at least, thanks in large part to Barkley's best performance of the series. Ainge cut Chicago's lead to three with a bucket from downtown and a lay-in in the final minute, but he perhaps rushed his final attempt to tie the game and Pippen swatted it out of the sky with one gangly, outstretched arm. So the Suns became the first NBA Finals team to lose their first two games at home, and it looked like the series would end in Chicago. Barkley picked up a right elbow injury in game two that had to be drained before game three and hampered his production somewhat. In an absolute marathon, triple overtime game, Charles missed a chance to break a tie before the final buzzer, then missed another game-winning attempt in overtime. But at last, the co-stars stepped up. Johnson finally penetrated the defense and scored 25 points. And Marley was the hero. He hit the shot that tied up the second overtime, and in the third OT, buried his 6-3 of the night from way downtown off a of feed from Barkley. Charles iced the game with a very sneaky steal and lay in, and suddenly the Suns had regained some of the ground they'd lost in Phoenix. All the talk after the game was about defense, how Johnson and Marley had stepped up to not just limit Pippen, but slow down Jordan, which is funny because Michael scoring 44 points counts as slowing him down. And it's also funny because everyone knew Jordan would see those headlines and go on a rampage in the next game, which he did. 55 points on just 37 shots. Just disgusting. Even with all that, Johnson and Barkley kept Phoenix alive in Game 4. KJ found Barkley for a dunk to cut Chicago's lead to two with just a minute left. But after Barkley stole the ball to give Phoenix a game-tying opportunity, Pippen stripped Marley, then Johnson just fumbled the inbound pass. 
That gave Jordan this chance to ice the game, which was a bad idea. I do not recommend doing that. A Barkley triple-double went for naught, and the Suns sat on the brink of elimination, down 3-1 with one more road game ahead. The city of Chicago prepared for riots if they won their third straight title at home. But game five kept the streets quiet. Barkley was merely solid, but he did a fine job passing out of doubles, like this setup for the Johnson and one that put the game away for good. Besides another brilliant Jordan outing, the main silver lining for the Bulls was veteran sharpshooter John Paxson. He'd been silent earlier in the series, but came alive for four three-pointers. This was an unfortunate bit of foreshadowing for Phoenix. But with a Game 5 victory, the Suns had miraculously regained home court advantage. The always chatty Barkley got especially bold. He told reporters the Suns were destined to win the series, that it was what God wanted. And he openly considered retiring when they did so. He relished the idea of going out on top like the NFL's Jim Brown did, and doing so after winning Olympic gold, NBA MVP, and a championship in the span of a year would be quite a way to leave the game. The series returned to Phoenix for the final two games. It wouldn't go that long. While Jordan and Pippen were merely good in Game 6, the big story was Chicago's outside shooting. They broke Phoenix's recently set team record for three-pointers in a finals game by burying 10 of them. Four of those deep buckets came from B.J. Armstrong, but the most devastating one came from the hands of Paxson. With the Suns up two down the stretch, Barkley kinda overplayed Pippen, which required help, and left Paxson open to grab Chicago the lead with just seconds remaining. On their next and final possession, Phoenix failed to find Barkley posting up, and Johnson couldn't get a clean shot off at the buzzer. Time expired, and Michael Jordan's Bulls secured their third straight championship. Two of those rings came at Barkley's expense. His 96ers never had as much talent as they did in the early 80s, and his sons came up short in some huge moments. But more than anything else, Charles Barkley entered his 30s without a title because Michael Jordan and the Bulls were indomitable, inevitable. Stung by that narrow finals loss and still relishing stardom, Barkley didn't see himself in the right place to retire. Jordan, however, did. Exhausted, mired in controversy about his gambling habit, and mourning the tragic death of his father, MJ shocked the NBA by leaving to play baseball. The Bulls dynasty stopped in its tracks. A new window opened for Barkley to grab his ring, but a new hand reached out to slam it shut. Maybe more than one hand, and one of the hands is actually a back. Jordan's absence in 94 and late return in 95 gave the rest of the NBA two cracks at winning a championship. Both those championships are held by the Houston Rockets, not Barkley's sons. Yet on both of those playoff runs, the Rockets nearly lost to Phoenix. So what happened? The first thing you need to know is that Hakeem Olajuwon, another 1984 draftee, was unbelievable by this point in his career. Jordan's baseballing days coincided with two of Olajuwon's best seasons. He stayed mostly healthy. He commanded the paint for an elite defense. His height and peerless grace made him an unstoppable scorer, and if he focused too much on that, he had become very good at passing to an improving cast of teammates who had the green light to fire away from outside. Hakeem made the Rockets a mighty foe. A second, very important variable was Barkley's health. His back had given him trouble before, even during his MVP year, and his 93-94 season began with a pinched nerve in training camp that left him supine on the floor, unable to move. Aching and still grumpy, Barkley once again contemplated retiring at season's end. He tore his right quadriceps tendon in January 94, and honestly, that might have been a blessing in disguise, because the month-long absence gave him time to rest his back and get right for the playoffs. And he did look sharp in the first round. Phoenix's sweep of the Warriors included a 56-point Barkley performance in Game 3. Barkley, two more, he's got 56 points. He got rolfing treatment immediately after that series. That was the same first round in which the league's best regular season team, the Seattle Supersonics, lost to the Nuggets in a historic upset. Houston and Phoenix were the next best teams in the West, so their second round matchup felt likely to produce the eventual Western finalist. After two games, that was clearly going to be Phoenix. They twice overcame ungodly Olajuwon numbers and double-digit deficits. A record-setting 20-point fourth-quarter comeback forced overtime in a Game 2 the Suns eventually won. Phoenix thus stole both of the first two games in Houston. 
Johnson played great, Marley rained threes, the bench, which now included veteran big man AC Green, came through. Even the hobbled Barkley stepped up to drop 34 and 15 in the second game. The Arizona Republic foresaw their local team winning not just the series, but the whole thing. While the Houston Chronicle, on a now infamous sports page, saw fit to dub their hometown Choke City. Charles said if the Suns couldn't get it done now, it would be their own fault. But after playing 50 minutes in Game 2, Barkley's spine was mush, and he played poorly back in Phoenix. Johnson was brilliant in the next two games, but Vernon Maxwell turned a Houston comeback into a full-on blowout in Game 3, and Kenny Smith complimented Olajuwon with outside shooting to even the series in Game 4. The Rockets returned to Houston with home court advantage restored. Charles refused to give excuses, but his gritty 30-point Game 5 performance unfortunately coincided with Johnson's worst game of the round and a scoreless night from Marley. The Suns got blown out and fell behind in the series. Though Phoenix pushed it to a seventh game, they had no prayer of stopping Hakeem in the clincher. Olajuwon was amazing, and rookie Sam Cassell played a huge game off the bench. Barkley was so frustrated by pain and failure that he simply started shoving people in the final seconds and got ejected rather than wait for the final buzzer. Charles was ready to walk away from the sport a loser if doctors determined his back would need surgery, but he recovered enough to stick around. He and the Suns had another injury-riddled season in 94-95, but once again pulled it together for a first-round sweep of the Blazers and once again took a second-round series lead over the Rockets. This time they were the higher seed and handled their home games to go up 2-0 behind big nights from Barkley and Johnson. Barkley served up an 0-for-10 dud in a Game 3 loss, so he let Johnson take the reins and dominate every aspect of a Game 4 victory in Houston. A squad that Barkley dubbed Butt Kicking Incorporated felt like this particular butt was just about kicked. The Rockets were grouchy, shorthanded, and badly beaten up. AC Green went so far as to guarantee series victory, and that seemed like an even safer bet when Houston newcomer Clyde Drexler fell victim to a stomach flu and offered Olajuwon basically no support during Game 5 in Phoenix. But despite another huge game from KJ, the Suns just gave that one away. Barkley was one of several players to miss key free throws down the stretch, allowing Olajuwon to send the game to OT, where the deflated Suns would fall apart for good. The Rockets took care of Game 6 at home, and suddenly the Suns, after all that talk, faced another Game 7. And they actually led big at halftime of that one. Barkley was once again suffering, this time from knee pain that required multiple mid-game injections, but Johnson took over. Phoenix had a chance to put the game out of reach when foul trouble benched Olajuwon for a bunch of the third quarter, but Houston's Kenny Smith kept the minute and Olajuwon returned for a masterful fourth. With seven seconds left and the game tied, Houston bench player Mario Eli got the ball in his favorite spot and buried one of the ballsiest three-pointers in NBA history, followed by the famous kiss of death. Ironically enough, the team that had missed key free throws in game five sealed their fate when Ainge banked in what was meant to be an intentional miss down two points in the closing second. If only he'd had the same luck on his final prayer from half court. And the Houston Rockets are going back to the Western Conference Finals. So the 95 Suns blew it again, in even more humiliating fashion. While the Rockets plowed forth to win another championship, Charles, physically and mentally broken, said this time he really would retire. He didn't, but maybe he should have. The Suns began to fall apart the following season, so while preparing for the 96 Olympics, Charles made a stink and got himself a trade to join Hakeem and the Rockets. He hoped to ride their coattails to grab one of those trophies before injuries took him down for good. But as some people foresaw, all Charles did was make an old, slowing team older and slower. Houston's best shot at doing anything with a core of aging legends went up in smoke when John Stockton eliminated them with a Game 6 buzzer beater in 1997. Barkley spent his remaining years injured and inferior, and as they transitioned into a new era, the Rockets never came close to contending. It probably didn't matter since Jordan's Bulls were back to destroying everyone. After years of retirement threats, what really ended Barkley's career was a ruptured quad in 1999. The 37-year-old returned the following April for a six-minute stint and a single basket, just so he could go out on his own terms, relatively speaking. And yeah, Barkley went out ringless. His Sixers peaked before he arrived. 
His prime coincided with that of Michael Jordan and the Bulls, and his best shot to unseat their dynasty contained some really bad breaks. Untimely injuries and another monster from the 84 draft class made for devastating collapses during Jordan's absence. By the time Barkley began unabashedly chasing a ring, that team and his own body were long gone. Thankfully, we have so many other ways to measure greatness. In a team sport, one player can only do so much, and Charles Barkley did just about everything he could. Thank you for watching the first episode of Untitled. If you've got more people you think would make good subjects for episodes, feel free to recommend them, and since you sat through that whole thing, I guarantee you'll like one of these videos.